Today's video is sponsored by Skillshare. Okay, <laughs> let's talk about this. You don't need to induce a patient who is already unconscious, unless you want to kill him. I don't get it. I don't get it. Grey's Anatomy, call me because I would love to help you consult for your show. Let's unpack this. There's a lot of clapping, which means I'm getting real excited in this episode. One time, I lost a patient from this exact way. All right, now you see, we got the white coat on. By the way, anesthesiologists never wear white coats, but we're still doctors. Hello guys, welcome back to my channel. Today we're gonna to be reacting to a requested episode of Grey's Anatomy. That is season 17, episode 10, and I was requested by many of you because apparently there's a whole lot of airway management in this episode. So you guys know I'm not a regular Grey's Anatomy watcher, but over the years that I've been doing these react videos, I have started to catch on to who the characters were, and I was a former watcher of the first first through third seasons when the show first aired on TV. So yeah, I am super excited to film this video because I love all things airway. If you don't know, I am Christina Brawley. It's very nice to meet you. I hope that you will stick around on this channel because I am a physician anesthesiologist. That's a person who puts people to sleep, takes care of them during their surgery, keeps them pain-free, keeps their vitals intact, helps manage airways. I'm an airway expert. I'm a ventilator expert and I am a resuscitation expert. So resuscitating any, basically I like to think of anesthesia and surgery as um, hovering you on the precipice between living and dying, but doing so in order for you to have surgery. And we do so safely and we are trained for more than 12 years to do that in a safe manner. And we are full-fledged doctors. So that's what a an anesthesiologist is. So if you would like to stick around for more content like this, I also happen to be a lover of luxury. I make lifestyle vlogs. I have two girls and two dogs and one husband. <laughs> And I would love to have you back. So make sure you subscribe, hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of my future videos. And let's get started. Oh, let's talk about the, wait, let's talk about the ventilator settings. Ah! Okay, freeze. All right. So I've got, I've got the ventilator settings um, on my screen here. All right, so, so much to unpack here in the first few seconds of this episode that Meredith Grey contracted COVID in this season. And um, I'm assuming in the last couple of episodes that has been probably a prevailing pro plot point, but now it appears she has been intubated. They probably, I'm guessing, ended the l episode before this with her like crashing. Um, so she's on a ventilator. What you saw there was that she has an endotracheal tube, which is the breathing tube that passes between the vocal cords. It goes into the trachea and sits right up on top of the lungs. So just prior to entering where the lungs start, the bronchial tree, as we call it. The first thing you see is the letter A, and that is gonna tell you the mode that Meredith Grey is on. So there are different types of letters, and I'm actually familiar with this machine, although this is an ICU, like a standard ventilator. This is what you think of when you see a ventilator. In anesthesia, we use something completely different. Most people don't know that. Um, the only times I really manage a standard like critical care ventilator would be if I have a patient who is on a very advanced mode, such as APRV, airway pressure release ventilation, or a reverse IDE ratio, or on an oscillator, like that kind of, st like really, 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 really poor shape with regards to their lungs. And they come down for an emergency surgery and they have to come down on that special ventilator because my anesthesia machine is not capable of delivering that mode to them and they need that mode to survive, if that makes sense. But I do have ICU experience. I do have critical care experience and managing these. So let's unpack it. So the A stands for the mode, but basically she is initiating her own breaths, which means she's not paralyzed. She's not so over sedated that the machine has to completely take over. Um, and next thing you see is P, peak, which is 27. A peak pressure of 27 is 
very, very decent. The mean is just like what it sounds like. It's the average of the pressure that the lungs are seeing over the time of the breath. Totally fine. Peep 5.1. I think it's really cool that they can dial in a peep in decimals because on my anesthesia machine, we can start as low as four and go up from there, but they're whole numbers. But five is a very, very, very standard kind of minimal peep range. And peep improves oxygenation. Peep is kind of stenting the airways open at the end of that breath. So it's sort of like not fully releasing a breath, if that makes sense. It's very hard to experience until you experience it yourself or you are in medical school and they hook up a special circuit and kind of show you what PEEP feels like. Anyway, I to E, I talked about reverse I to E ratios earlier, coincidentally, the ratio of one to 5.6, holy moly, that is a long, I, that is a very, very long I to E ratio. So it's an inspiratory time, the amount time of time spent inhaling versus the amount of time allowed for exhalation. So somebody who air traps, somebody with asthma, COPD, you're gonna want an I to E ratio of at least one to three or one to 3.5. That's where you're taking a breath, like naturally our inspiratory time is a lot shorter than our expiration. So let's think about this. Take a deep breath. So you can count. One, and then two, three, four. So you're gonna have three seconds of expiration time for every one second, if that makes sense. It's in parts, so one parts to three parts. But one to 5.7, which we'll call one to six, I don't think I've ever put a patient through that. Because what that means is get it in fast, which means the it's gonna be Does that make sense? It's really uncomfortable. Yeah, okay, we're gonna move on because I've spent way too much time talking about this. I wanna give a huge shout out to Skillshare who is today's video sponsor. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people. You can explore new skills, develop existing interests, and get lost in creativity. So whether you're looking to fend off boredom, focus on self-care, or join a similarly creative community through your creativity, Skillshare is the place to keep you learning. The first 1,000 people to use a link in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. And after that, it's only around $10 a month. So for around $10 a month, Skillshare has been teaching me various skills, such as Fundamentals of DSLR Photography by Justin Bridges, or Digital Illustrative Typography by Janet Liao. Once again, the first 1,000 people to use a link in my description will get a free trial of the Skillshare Premium Membership. And after that, it's only around $10 a month. Check out the link in the description box below. Oh, baby! All COVID, baby! Two recently admitted to ICU after SATs dropped below 87%. She was in a lot of discomfort last night. This worries too much. He needs more patience. <laughs> or a hobby. Well, when are you gonna start my singing lessons? <sighs> Marcella taught me. All right, so you might be wondering what's in this lady's nose and it's different than, because it looks different than nasal cannula, which is like a simple two prong. Um, this looks like to me to be nasal CPAP, which is basically similar to what Meredith Grey was put on. Um, your breaths are initiated by yourself, but what it does is instead of a traditional CPAP that goes over the mouth and, and goes through the mouth and nose, you can actually opt to have nasal CPAP. This is great for people who have obstructive sleep apnea and sleep at night, but get claustrophobic with a, a mask that covers the whole face. How's Meredith? Her vital signs are stable. Her morning labs are good. Oxygen requirements are decreasing. Uh, enough to take her off the vent? Uh, let's see if the trend continues. Well, let's hope it does, and not just for her sake. As of five o'clock this morning, we are down to our last four available ventilators. So until relief arrives, I need us all to think creatively. Ventilators are our last resort. Put them on BiPAP, the hyperbaric chamber, uh, proning. Let's exhaust all options first. Okay, hyperbaric chamber. <laughs> Let's not get ahead of ourselves, Chief. All right, so 
So they're down to four ventilators left. And this actually is very, very reminiscent of what actually happened in Italy and New York during the surge last year in 2020. Ventilator shortage was a real deal. And it's something we've probably never encountered before, except in the polio epidemic. And then even that was like an iron lung situation. What did we actually do about it? Well, we definitely freed up emergency ventilators from, I guess, like sort of not, I don't want to call it safe houses or banks, but like basically where we had ventilators sitting and not being used and available for like National Guard use and all that kind of stuff. We freed those and made those available to the areas where the pandemic was hitting us the hardest, at least here in the United States. There was also some really ingenious use by colleagues of mine that included um, splitting ventilator tubing and using one ventilator for two patients. And using one ventilator for two patients. Really difficult because you fine tune each ventilator for a patient specific condition and and lung size. So I found that people were matching people with very similar disease progresses and similar body habitus and civil, similar um, oxygenation and ventilation requirements because you can't give one one setting and one the other like they have to be tolerable tolerating both both have to be tolerating the same setting and um, it's just really interesting oxygen was um, a problem there was a shortage of oxygen and there was tubing running in and out of windows and tracing the hallways it was absolutely insane um, let's talk about BiPAP. BiPAP is another form of CPAP, which is the PEEP that we mentioned before. So just like that lady was on nasal CPAP, BiPAP is just a little bit different. So instead of only focusing on the end pressure that stays, that keeps those airways open after you breathe your breath out, BiPAP will be a little bit of a step further and it actually is like a non-invasive ventilation. So without a breathing tube, but it's forcing some air in when you trigger a breath and then it's letting those airways stay open as you breathe that breath out. So it's kind of like a, a little bit of a boost for you if you're getting weak, for example. That's always a nice thing. And I found that uh, over the last year, the trend has been to shift more to BiPAP instead of invasive ventilation, like in intubating someone, which is my my expertise. Um, my expertise also encompasses BiPAP, but I rarely use that because nobody calls me to place someone on BiPAP. That's that's something that a respiratory therapist and a pulmon pulmonary or critical care doctor can definitely manage them. I mean, they handle intubations too, by the way, but um, obviously we kind of all share the same expertise, but, and when it comes to intubating all day, every day, nobody does it more than an anesthesiologist. ER doctors do it, pulmonary and critical care doctors do it, respiratory therapists intubate, um, and then of course our advanced practice providers who work in the critical care setting will do it. They also said her oxygen requirements are decreasing, which is a very good sign because that means that she's not requiring as much supplemental oxygen to stay alive. So if you extubate Meredith and she starts to trend downward again, we may not have another one available. So let's not make the call to pull her off until we are 100% certain. Crazy anatomy. Okay, so this is an interesting, I don't know, I feel a little bit icky about how he said that about Meredith. So keeping someone, it's not, really ethical to keep someone on a ventilator because they're your friend or your colleague if they don't need it because you're fearful they won't get it if they need it again. I don't know. I just feel like, well, what about that patient that does need it that's sitting there waiting for one and this person doesn't need it, but because she's a doctor and your colleague and your friend, you want to keep her on it so you can like save a spot for her? I don't know. How do you feel about that? Let me know in the comments. Alive and well, sorry to disappoint. You heard about the vents? I did. So you know if we pull Gray's tube too soon, we don't I have- I heard it. about the vents, Tom. I'm gonna guess that this guy who I remember from the first episode of this season, um, he's a little prickly, but I bet you he cares the most. Do you, I find that preceptors, mentors, in, in instructors, professors, all throughout my extensive lifetime of schooling and training, I found that the prickliest people, I like the word prickly, okay? 
let me use it. The prickliest people were the ones that cared the most. They felt like they had the most to lose, they had the most anxiety, or they had the most passion about what they were doing or making sure that you did your job right or making sure that everything was perfect because they cared the most about the patient, the most. And I bet you he's like that too. He's probably like, he's probably like an M&M. Oh, there he is. This is happening? It is definitely happening. I hope this wasn't a bad time. I abandoned a play date and I need a calendar to remember the last time I operated. It's <laughs> definitely not a bad time. How severe is it? See for yourself. Ooh, is Cross he an orthopedic surgeon? Right? Okay, folks, let's get the OR ready with the X-Fix set and the CR. That is an orthopedic surgeon. Bad boy. I Dr. love Weber. him. Where do we, where Thank do we you know so him much. from? Teen movies? Dawson's Creek? No. What was he from? A lithotripsy. That's a procedure with a tiny, tiny laser that breaks it down into smaller pieces. Broken into pieces? That's what killed my sister. Oh, no, this is nothing like the Morse later, Irene. If it was, I wouldn't let it anywhere near you. So it's safe. Completely routine. Takes about 45 minutes in typical cases. I have a mess. Am I still a typical case? No, because you have me for your doctor. Ooh. Okay, <laughs> so uh, I, I like to use, um, I like to use false, how do you say this? Like false ego as a as humor, but um, it does doesn't look like it's humor here. This it looks like this this urologist really does, does believe she's the best. But um, I would uh, I'm foreshadowing. It probably not. It's probably not going to turn out great. MS not a typical case, and it's not something that always a urologist or a surgeon or the person who is performing a procedure thinks about. They're like, oh, you just have MS, and as long as I can do my job, you're gonna be fine. But nobody ever really thinks about the fact that MS is a very special case for anesthesia because there are certain things you must do and not do under anesthesia, which I won't get into today, but Keeping that in mind, it is a more complex case and it's something that an anesthesiologist will look at and say, okay, I'm gonna alter my management for you as opposed, as opposed to a typical other patient because you have MS. So we're gonna do this, 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 and this. Let me know if you guys would like to, me to weigh in on that more or other special case scenario diseases for anesthesia, I'd be happy to do that. I know there's a big request for Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, EDS. Um, yeah, let me know in the comments. Yes, I just mm -hmm. wanted to enjoy the moment. Mm -hmm. Lord knows when it'll happen again. After this, we'll secure the frame. You'd never know you didn't do three of these this morning. Oh, yeah, I didn't. But By the way, I do the anesthesia for this type of case all the time, the other type of case, the lithotripsy, all the time. These are bread and butter, very, very simple cases. But as we always know, simple case, not always a simple patient. Simple case, not always a simple patient. That is impolite adult conversation. Sorry, I rarely get to talk to adults. <laughs> Wait, what happened? Heart rate's in the 120s, the so stats are dropping. They could have thrown a fat embolism. Oh, come on, all right, push oh, fluids and let's get them packed up for a CTA. Did you call your mom? All right, <laughs> I love, I love, love, and I mean this with all sarcasm here full sarcasm drip effect. I love that the orthopedic surgeon is calling the shots on what to do for a pulmonary embolism and they show no anesthesiologist there. Like they do not show this, the anesthesiologist, let's, can we roll that footage back again of dun dun, the invisible anesthesiologist? Because that's what this show is. Unless there is an anesthetic problem or a moral turpitude issue with the anesthesiologist on they show, they do not exist. There is no anesthesiologist character, to my knowledge, that is good. I don't get it. I don't get it. It sucks. Grey's Anatomy, call me because I would love to cons help you consult for your show so that you can get this right because my channel is the way it is because the public is interested in the field of anesthesiology. All right, rant over. Pulmonary embolism, we've talked about this on my channel before, so you probably already know this. A clot or a particle of some sort that is blocking the, 
blood flow to the lungs, meaning no gas exchange. That can cause hypoxemia, which is a lack of oxygen in the blood, and that can also have devastating effects on the heart. As you saw, the heart rate kicked up. More concerning is actually the hypoxemia. So you, it doesn't matter how much you're breathing for that patient, the, the oxygen exchange is blocked. There is no blood flow to the lungs, and they are imminently going to die. Does that mean that, so a CTA, I mean, I would argue a CTA is a contrast, is a, is a CAT scan of an artery with contrast. So basically visualizing to see if there is a, a blockage there. And I say blockage because it's not always a blood clot. It's traditionally a blood clot, but it can be a fat embolism. So when you're working with the long bones, specifically usually the legs, anytime you're drilling into the medulla of the, the basically like bone marrowy area of a long bone, there's a lot of fat there and that can go into the bloodstream via the bones. And that can actually cause like, like little Let's think of it as a popcorn, okay? So let's think of it as a popcorn that travels through your blood, little tiny popcorn. It travels through your blood and then it gets lodged into the vasculature of the lungs, and that is a fat embolism. The third type of embolism, of pulmonary embolism, is called a amniotic fluid embolism, and that's when you talk about um, during a C-section, during a delivery, it would be like, the, the, the woman just keels over and dies. And I have seen it happen and we have brought them back and then there are times we have not been able to bring them back. It is absolutely devastating. And it is a, a all hands on deck support. I actually had a patient one time I lost a patient from this exact way and it's the only time I've ever lost a patient on the table and there was nothing we could do. We tried everything. We tried all measures, CPR for I don't even know how long, everything that we had available to us and I was their anesthesiologist and I could not bring them back and it was because of an embolism from an orthopedic surgery and I won't get into the specifics, but it was uh, devastating to me, to the family, to the rest of the OR team. Everybody was devastated. Yeah, so that really hits home. <clears throat> With that large of an embolism, he's gonna have to stay on the vent for at least a few days. This never should have happened. This was a, a complication. I mean, there's nothing you could or should have done better. I'm just angry with this whole situation. I mean, saving this young man's life means we're down to one available vent, which now means I have to close the doors to our trauma, which means people will die unnecessarily. Oof. He's so upset because now they're gonna have to go and divert, which is absolutely devastating to a community because you are basically saying, we cannot take any more people, we cannot take any more traumas. Traumas now have to get diverted to a farther away hospital, which increases patient mortality and morbidity. So yeah, that's what he means by more people will die unnecessarily, is that statistically, that is a big deal. I almost never see that. Christina. Is she still on the show? Tell me she's still on the show. Okay. Christina. Oh, he sent me a pic of her monitors. That's so something I would do. <laughs> I know how to read her monitor. <laughs> uh, best friends. That's a high heart rate. She's in the hundreds. Rap. <laughs> Oh gosh, she's decompensating. I need a crash card in here now, and someone page Dr. Pierce. What, are you sure you don't want to wait until the- No, saturation levels are plummeting and- What? Oxygenate patient. Oh my god, wait, hold on. Uh, what is he doing? And Stop! Agent. Why is he speaking the steps out loud? Oh, he's doing, he's got the mask upside down. Oh god. This is so bad, you guys. This is so bad, okay. He's like, you don't need to induce some, let me, let me just say this one more, let me just say this loud and clear, okay? Any doctors out there? You don't need to induce a patient who is already unconscious, unless you wanna kill them. If they're unstable and they're unconscious, they don't need induction. That is how you kill someone. You ready? 
Okay, he's intubating. He's got a disposable uh, Loringa scope. Stylet is coming out. This is probably the first time I've actually seen them try and show you intubation, which I kind of like. But I, like I said, Grey's Anatomy, call me. Now can no, we please get any. a ventilator in here? Oh my god. There isn't one. Okay. Can we unpack this? Let's unpack this. There's a lot of clapping, which means I'm getting real excited in this episode. All right, so they have intubated her. What you saw is sort of pretty much realistic. They didn't show induction, which I hope is because they didn't push induction drugs. Induction of anesthesia, meaning medicines to render you unconscious, which also lower the blood pressure and ca can cause cardiovascular collapse to a patient on the brink. Never mind that. Paralytic is another thing. Do you absolutely have to have paralytic on board to intubate someone? No, I intubate patients all the time without paralytic. You don't absolutely need that. I have intubated patients, intubated patients just like that. So it's a very delicate process, right? You have a metal, typically metal, laryngoscope, which is that blade, a lighted blade with a fiber optic light on the end of it. And you're inserting that into the patient's mouth. You're rounding around the curvature of the tongue. You're lifting the floor of the mouth up and you are using that to then visualize the vocal cords, which will look, which look like this. And you need to visualize the vocal cords so you know you're going, putting the tube in the right place. People are killed because someone thinks they see the vocal cords and don't, and they put it in the esophagus. And then they proceed to bag the patient, fill the patient's stomach with air instead of the lungs, and the patient dies because they're not getting any oxygen. Uh, so yes, that actually is a very well-known killer of patients. He's put the blade in the mouth. He's now asked for the tube and he's put, there's a stylet there and that is to help bend the shape of this plastic endotracheal tube. It gets you a little bit more structure and then you take that stylet out once you're, you've got the balloon, the little cuff that helps seal the breathing, the airway past the vocal cords. You know you're in the right place. You take the stylet out, you take the blade out and you hook them up to the ventilator or to the ambo bag as you saw. So the question remains, what happened to her? Well, it's interesting that they just did solely airway. You could definitely just bag this patient, although in the advanced cardiac life support algorithm, you eventually are gonna need to move towards an advanced airway, which is putting a breathing tube in. But did he have to jump to intubating her? And why aren't they doing compressions? I did all the time, even as a resident, I intubated people while they were doing compressions. Why? Because compressions are the most important in a patient who has cardiovascular collapse. More important than the airway, okay? More important. So when I would run to a code and they would call for me to intubate the patient while they're running the code, I would say continue the compressions unless I tell you otherwise. And I would start to go like this <laughs> at the plate and I would start like timing myself to uh, bounce up and down with the patient who is, you know, being flopped like this because they're, there's someone is pushing on their chest like this. And then I'd gently put the blade in their mouth and then I'd have the tube and I'd intubate them while bouncing. I'm laughing. It's a really scary process. And, um, but yeah, never, never lost, never lost an airway that, and I did it while with a moving target in a very delicate process. Um, it, it just goes to show it's not the most important thing. Compressions are the most important thing. Not really clear why he jumped to intubate her, but it does sound like he's young and maybe inexperienced and that might have been some poor judgment. The machines oh, are capable both of, of delivering Sharing much stronger event. pressure than anyone. We just cut through needs. talking about this. You just this. need to adapt the vent to serve two patients at once by using a T or a Y-shaped splitter on the airflow tube. And we're using viral filters to prevent cross-contamination of particles between patients. All of this was Pierce's idea. It's not ideal, but it buys us some time until we get some reinforcements. Yes! <laughs> Okay, this is what we just got through talking about. This was exactly what was happening in New York and I believe Italy as well during um, the kind of epicenter of the pandemic last year. And again, T-splitter, definitely there were some that were 3D printing them. Some anesthesiologist friends of mine were 3, 3D printing and designing them to help their hospital system. They um, adapted the settings to increase the pressures and stuff. So because as you increase, as you split, you're having the pressure. So you have to increase some of your settings correspondingly. 
they they're of two different habituses and two different ages i'm i'm surprised that it's working i hope it, it do, that it does work for them but it is true and you're definitely going to want a hepa filter which is a very very high density um like very very small micron diameter permitted basically let's let air through and nothing else so no viral particles and we put those on the circuit of any anesthesia machine that's going to be hooked up to a covid positive patient where's the lungs are clear her ABGs are showing improved oxygenation oh, and she's passed her SBTs, her vitals are normalized. Okay, but I hope you lightened up the sedation. Prepare to extubate. Okay, <laughs> let's talk about this. So before she, we get back to the beach scene. So she passed her SBTs. What does that mean? Spontaneous breathing trials. That is when you minimize the vent settings, lower the sedation. So basically you're getting them as close to being awake and without a breathing tube. And all you're doing is basically compensating for the extra resistance that the tube provides, but the rest is all up to the patient. They're breathing on their own. You might have a little peep to help get that basically minimal vent settings and so you're helping them without taking the breathing tube all the way out because reintroducing a breathing tube could cause unnecessary airway trauma and she might be a lot more swollen than she was when it was first placed so it's a good idea to like have it there because it's like a safety net it's, a, it's your security blanket and see that she does okay for a little while and they pass and then you know basically you, you give the order and you extubate um the fun thing about anesthesia is that we're doing this constantly all day every day so we are testing your breathing um on your own whether you're conscious or unconscious hopefully unconscious because i like to extubate my patients quite deep under anesthesia it's a little bit more of a um, finesse to it it takes a little bit more skill a little bit more handling a little bit more monitoring and um closely watching but patients wake up really nice and comfortable, which I like. That's what we do all day, every day. And um, it's definitely something that's done in ICUs. That's kind of the most common place you would hear that term. And so she's passed, she's doing well. It, it, all, all signs point to extubate. That is gonna do it for today's episode. I hope you got a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of learning out of that. And like I said, it's an all good fun. I completely understand that these shows are for entertainment value and I'm not trying to ruin it. I get that sometimes in the comments. It's you're here to learn, you're watching the show for the entertainment and you're watching the react for the education and the knowledge. So with that, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, I would love it if you would give it a thumbs up and make sure that you are subscribed and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of my future videos. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.